Welcome to our celebration of Visak, which is a celebration of the Buddha's birth. We have the baby Buddha in the flower pagoda, and then his enlightenment, which is represented by him sitting up there in meditation, and then his peaceful passing away, which is now hidden by the flowers. And, um, but before you could probably see him, the reclining Buddha as the Buddha as he's passing away. And, um, and we have a uh, very privileged to have Ajahn Chandako here with us. Ajahn Chandako uh, was ordained in Thailand as a monk in 1990. I met him in, at, uh, at a Zen center in 1987 or something. He's been involved in Buddhism for a long time and, uh, trained in, trained in, uh, Thailand with some of the great forest masters, meditation masters there, and now has become an abbot of a monastery in New Zealand and, um, and is the uh, pseudo-abbot of a pseudo-monastery, a new monastery, virtual, virtual monastery. <laughs> uh, how, how many acres is it? Four and a half, yeah, four and a half acres that, uh, that, uh, his, um, that was bought for him up in Boulder Creek, right? So only a couple of minutes from Vajrapani, Tibetan Retreat Center. And it's an undeveloped property that uh, he's just now going to go and take up residence for the next month there. And, uh, and uh, it's a little bit of a mystery how he's going to manage it up there because monks like him um, uh, don't eat unless people bring him food. And so four and a half acres and a dirt road behind a dirt road behind a dirt road up a hill with no water. <laughs> but <laughs> faith, renunciation, both help. <laughs> some days it's faith will support him and some days renunciation will support him <laughs> and I'm, I'm delighted that he's coming to the area uh, it's a tremendous respect for Arjun Chandako and his practice and his wisdom and, and to have him relatively close by in the peninsula uh, mountains you know, it's been a dream for a long time for me that there be monastic presence here in the peninsula so he's not going to be here full time uh, because um, he has responsibilities in New Zealand but it's nice that he's here and uh, and he was also very graciously uh, willing to come and do our Visak today. And uh, I told him a little bit about how we usually do it and told him that, um, that uh, improv style works really well for us as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you and welcome. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everyone today. Uh, I'm actually very grateful to Gil because in many ways he was uh, he played an important role an important part in my life when I was looking uh, for a place to practice Buddhism under you know, full time and he had just come back from Asia and I met him at a pivotal point and uh, after speaking to him I bought a one way ticket to Thailand <laughs> that was uh, over 20 years ago I think. okay Okay, next. Okay. All right. So at this point, uh, actually, before I do the Namo Tassa, uh, I'd like to invite the Davis. Now, we have a, uh, a chant that we do, uh, which is, um, it dates from ancient times, and it's actually... Uh, meant to invite the devas, which are positive spiritual forces, uh, to come down uh, specifically to join us for auspicious occasions. And then after that, uh, we can go into the Namotasa and take the three refuges. <laughs> Bhūmā-chayāntun-devāṅjala-tala-vi-sāmeyāka-gandhā-banāgā Tetanda sandi ke yang muni wa facha nang sa da wome sunantu. Bua 
ดาทัศนกาลอยังบดันทาดัมมาสวรรคาลอยังบดันทาสังกามปาหิรุปัสนาคาลอยังบดันทาเราเซนามุทัสสะบาวะโตอะระหะโตสมาสัมปุทัสสะ three times and after that you can repeat นามุทัสสะบาวะโตอะระหะโตสมมาสัมปุทัสสะนามุทัสสะบาวะโตอะระหะโตสมมาสัมปุทัสสะนโมตัสสะบาคาวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุตัสสะ Okay, please repeat three times. <laughs> <laughs> Take refuge in the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha. Buddha Hang Saranang Gachami, Dhamma Hang Saranang Gachami, Sangha Hang Saranang Gachami, Dutiyam Bim Buddha Hang Saranang Gachami. ดุทิยามพินธามังสานังกาชามิดุทิยามพิสังขังสานังกาชามิทัตยามพิมบุทังสานังกาชามิตัดยามปินธามังสานังกาชามิตัดยามปิสังขังสานังกาชามิโอเค now I hear the children have a special chant that they're going to teach us is that right yeah Suki Hondu Sabe Sata Suki Hondu
Thanks for warning. <laughs> It's one of the best introductions I've ever had. It you know, just lowers the expectation. So it's, it, Okay, so prepare, prepare yourself for a really boring talk. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambhutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambhutasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa Buddhang Dhammang Sankhang Namasami So Vesak is the celebration of uh, the Buddha's birth, enlightenment, and passing away. And tradition has it that they all occurred on the full moon of May. So Waisak uh, is usually uh, the first full moon or the only full moon in May. This Waisak uh, is a blue moon Waisak. Actually, we have uh, two full moons this month. So the whole month has been uh, filled with Waisak celebrations because no one knows when to celebrate it. Some people <laughs> celebrate it the first full moon. Uh, some the second, and basically anywhere in between, <laughs> or afterwards. <laughs> now, the Buddha's uh, birth is uh, fairly well documented. Uh, the Buddha's death, uh, peaceful passing away into Parinibbana, again, is uh, you know, well outlined in the, the Parinibbana Sutta, in the Digha Nikaya. What I'd like to talk about tonight this morning, is uh, the Buddha's enlightenment. Because the idea of enlightenment, the concept of enlightenment, it can be vague, it can be a bit mysterious. Uh, What is this all about? But basically, the path of the Buddha, the whole idea of the Dhamma, is to aim towards enlightenment. But, I mean, what is it? If we don't don't at least have an idea of what it is, an accurate idea of where we're going, then it's difficult to know if we're actually taking the initial steps in the right direction. So I'd like to pick up the story of the Buddha's path to enlightenment and talk a bit about that and, and the, the obstacles he encountered, the challenges and the, the successes. So we take the story from the point where the Buddha was undergoing, I would say, a bit of a crisis. He was living in the palace. Uh, He had basically all most people would hope for. He had financial security. He had job security. Right? I mean, he was, people were just waiting for him to take over the realm. He was a prince. Uh, He had, from what we can tell, a very happy family life. And at the same time, there was there was some very deep questioning going on in his mind. At a point in his life, in his late 20s, he had encountered the reality of old age, sickness, and death. And so the, the question started to arise, well, what are we doing this all for? You know, I mean, what's the point of, 
of creating a, a fantastic life if we're just going to die. And having been so sheltered from death, not unlike, say, modern society, then suddenly the reality of death came upon him. And he said, well, you mean everyone I love is going to die? You mean I'm going to die? And just this was enough to, to create some, you know, bring up some fundamental questions about what he was going to do with his life and the best way to use a human life. So, uh, the story goes that he finally decided, look, I just need to work this out in my own way. And he left home. And I'm going to talk a bit about the story that's in the suttas, which I would consider the most reliable story. There are a whole variety of different stories and embellishments about the Buddha's life and the path to enlightenment. Uh, But I'm going to try to just stick to the story in the suttas. In the story in the suttas, there's no talk of him leaving uh, his wife, Yasodhara, in the middle of the night, or his, his newborn baby son in the middle of the night as is commonly uh, thought of. But he did say that his, his parents were, you know, they didn't, they didn't want him to leave, and he left with them in tears. So this whole uh, idea of the initial renunciation of the home life is uh, it's not an easy thing, as any, uh, well, most of the nun, monks or nuns that I know uh, it has been a, a major decision. You know, it's not something that we take lightly. But he reflected that the words he used was the home life was cramped and dusty. And say, well, how did he, how did he mean you know, cramped and dusty? What exactly do, does that mean? But the idea that it's just difficult to lead a perfectly pure spiritual life when one has all the responsibilities of the home life, uh, when one has a responsibility uh, with family, with job, with just the, the amount of time uh, and mental energy it takes to look after all that, and the moral dilemmas that we can find ourselves in. Um, if you own a house, then you have a responsibility to keep it free of termites or cockroaches, or if you have a a restaurant, then you have the responsibility to keep it free of insects. And then, and then what do you do? You know, if you're a Buddhist practitioner, you've got this moral dilemma on your hands. Whereas uh, there's a certain external freedom and, say, internal uh, freedom or opportunity to, to, to practice the path 100% uh, going forth. So he went forth, uh, not in any um, organized institution like we have today, but, but just as a, a wanderer. And, you know, just basically going out and uh, following his call it inner voice or inner question and deciding that you know, I'm just going to find an answer and I'm going to keep going until I find the answer. So his initial teachers... Uh, were Alara Kalama and Uddhika Ramaputta. And quite often you hear the saying, well, the Buddha didn't have a teacher. He didn't have any teachers himself. Um, but actually he did. His initial attempt was to find the, the greatest teachers of the day, to go to them, see what they had to offer. And so the first teacher he went to was um, teaching a doctrine of nothingness, which was very advanced and the teacher was very impressive. Uh, after mastering it and being invited to, to teach the congregation or the, the Sangha uh, with the teacher, uh, he still felt that that hadn't gone far enough. And the words that he uses to describe it are, it, it still hadn't give, it still didn't give rise to these, these qualities of, uh, in Pali, I'll teach you a bit of Pali first, Nibita, Viraga, Niroda. And so these are qualities which play a pivotal role in all the Buddhist teachings from the very beginning right up to the end. So 
So this idea of nibbita is this, a, it's a way of turning away, actually, turning away from the, the sensual world, uh, the, the normal way of looking for happiness. We're all looking for happiness in one way or another. It's to look for it in what we see, what we hear, what we smell, taste, and touch, and uh, mental stimulation. And nibbita is that, I, that initial, so you're seeing the drawbacks of it or the shortcomings, the limitations of that in turning away. Viraga is commonly translated as dispassion. So instead of um, in following passion or, or encouraging passion, uh, the Buddhist teaching is, is all about dispassion, like calming, calming passion. And niroda, which is cessation. Cessation of what? Cessation of all the, the stresses and problems, the, the sufferings of life. And, and peace and direct knowledge. Again, these were qualities that, that come in this sequence. And he wasn't finding this in this teaching of nothingness. This direct understanding, direct knowledge or the coolness of a full enlightenment. So even though that teacher considered himself enlightened and all of the, the students considered him enlightened, he felt that there was something more and continued his search. Uh, so at this point is when he went off and um, he wandered around the country for a while and eventually settled down at what he considered to be a beautiful little grove next to a nice clear flowing river and with a village for alms round nearby. So, at this point, he decided to try a different tract. Asceticism was a very common way of trying to conquer both the body and the mind. And so he decided uh, there that he was going to follow this path. Now, initially, the ways that he uh, attempted was one was to try to crush the mind with the mind. So, uh, it's important to know that if you, if you find yourself on a retreat sometime and you're trying to crush the mind, or crush your thoughts, uh, trying to annihilate your thoughts with, your, with the rest of your mind, then that is not a way which um, works very well. Uh, so he, had, he did that and that didn't particularly, uh, it wasn't particularly effective. Uh, then he, um, after crushing the mind with the mind, then it was, uh, um, let's see, I've crushed my mind, I've crushed on my thoughts. <laughs> That's what happens. Okay. See this? Then he, um, he tried the, the breathless meditation. You know, normally we talk about meditation, of mindfulness on the breath. Well, um, that's what he ended up with. But he started off with the breathless meditation. So he tried uh, not breathing at all. So he blocked up his, his uh, he held his breath with his nose and his mouth and, and uh, found that unfortunately he was still able to breathe with his ears. <laughs> uh, so that was a bit of an obstacle. So he, pl- he blocked up his ears. And then, uh, and held his breath, and he experienced incredible um, pains and difficulties in that process, to the point where uh, people thought he was dead. So that didn't seem to work. You can see, you know, he's really trying, pulling out all the stops. And then, well, let's uh, let's try fasting. Right? So he he said, well, okay, let's start reducing the food. And he kept reducing the food and reducing the food to the point where he was eating just, uh, say, one little fruit every two weeks or one little grain of rice or one sesame seed. And, uh, to the point where he was completely emaciated. I mean, just, just literally skin and bones where they say if, if he you know, tried to grab his spine uh, from the front, you know, he, could, he could just grab onto his spine and his backbone. Um, Any time that he you know, would rub his arms or legs, all the hair would come off, his skin would turn black. And 
just tr on just trying to do basic bodily functions, he would fall over. And he reached the point where he knew he was getting close to death. And he had choices. Either if he continues on this track, then, then he's probably going to die. Uh, but he considered, you can imagine him you know, uh, completely emaciated, taking this path as far as he could. He said, could it be that there's another path to enlightenment? <laughs> you can imagine just a glimmer of hope there. You know, could it be? <laughs> Maybe there's a different way. And then, and then something uh, really important happened. He had a memory of his childhood. And this childhood memory became uh, one of the pivotal points in his whole spiritual quest. And one of the pivotal points that... Uh, that that formed an important basis for his teaching throughout his whole career. He had the memory of when he was a, a young child and his father was the king undergoing a, a plowing ceremony, uh, which is still in, in, in uh, even in Thailand, was a regular thing that the kings would do. And while this was going on, you know, it was a bit boring for the child. So he sat underneath the tree in a nice cool place. No one else was around. And his mind just spontaneously went into a very deep and peaceful state of meditation, uh, which quite, of, quite often happens if we're not really trying. If we just get ourselves out of the way, then the mind just goes really peaceful. And he remembered that time. And he remembered how profound that was. And so the thought came up, could this be the path? Maybe this is the path. Because what had happened at that time was his mind went into a state where uh, it was so deep that it's what we call jhana. Jhana is a, a term in Pali which uh, signifies a particular a depth of meditation and concentration. And he thought, yeah, that was extremely powerful, meaningful, gave a great sense of clarity, and it was really pleasant. Now, up until this time, the whole idea of asceticism was you don't just deny yourself physical pleasure, but you also deny yourself mental pleasure. So he started to reconsider his whole attitude towards pleasure and said, well, why am I afraid of the mental pleasure? Why am I afraid of, of you know, the peace or joy that comes not through self-indulgence, but it comes from within, it comes from within our own heart. And so, you know, well, why am I afraid of that? And just through his own reflection, he started to think that, yeah, right, maybe, maybe this is the path. And even today, it's important to, to see how important, well, it's important to see how fundamental it is to, to have enjoyment in meditation. So, enjoy, so meditation is not merely a hard slog. It's not merely something that we force ourselves to do because we think it's good for ourselves. But it's something that uh, well, it's good to enjoy. We can allow ourselves to enjoy it. Now, this happiness that comes from concentration, he says, is not something to be feared. I mean, even today, you you have certain meditative traditions that will say. Well, if you're getting, if you're starting to get some happiness coming up in your meditation, we'll, we'll stay, stay away from that. Don't go there. Right? This is, uh, you'll get attached to it. And that's precisely the type of asceticism that the Buddhism, that the Buddha turned away from. And he said, well, there's actually nothing wrong with the happiness that comes from within the meditation. In fact, uh, joy and, 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 Happiness, and tranquility, these are, these are factors of enlightenment. These are important uh, aspects that are going to lead to full enlightenment. And so he, he started to reconsider his extreme asceticism. And at that point, he, he said, well, if I'm going to develop this deep concentration and what it will lead to, then I'm going to need a bit more bodily strength. And so he decided to take some plain boiled rice and bread. And at this time, he was accompanied by five other attendant uh, ascetics. 
And once they saw that he had taken some uh, plain boiled rice and bread, they thought, well, he's given up. Uh, you know, he'd taken it to the limit, but he just gave up. Uh, they said he, the quote was, he's reverted to luxury. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, these guys were really hardcore. <laughs> you know, I mean, he just had plain boiled rice. And he gets criticized for reverting to luxury. You know, it's a good thing he wasn't in the valley. You know, really, yeah, he would have imagined if he had had, say, like salmon quiche and cappuccino. You know, this is what they would have said then. But even with plain boiled rice and bread, uh, they got disgusted with him and they, they took off. But the Buddha was undaunted. Or at this point, he, he was not yet the Buddha, but he was the Buddha-to-be or Bodhisattva. So the Bodhisattva then, um, he wandered again, continued, and, and there is another place, traditional story uh, which is not found in the, the Sutta uh, story of when he, uh, when he goes to sit underneath a tree and uh, a young woman named Sujata offers him milk rice. And this is such a, a classic part of the traditional story that I have to, I'll say a little bit about it, but if you look in the suttas, the, it's actually missing. Uh, you only find that story in the commentaries, in the Jataka Nidana or the Mahavastu, you, you find that story. Um, but there was this young woman who would make annual sacrifices to her, uh, the god who lived in the tree, in her yard, and, and the Buddha happened to be uh, the Bodhisattva happened to be sitting underneath that tree one day, and, and uh, so she thought that, oh, well, that's the, that's the god, that's the, the local deity. So she offered him rice. And to this day, there, there still is a village just outside of Bodhigaya, which is called Sujata Village. And I remember the first time that I went on pilgrimage in India with a, a few other monks, we went on alms round to that village. We didn't have to, uh, but we just decided that we wanted to go on alms round uh, just as a, a way of honoring the Buddha, going to Sujata village. And these days, Sujata village is, is probably not that different than it was 2,500 years ago. Uh, it is very, very simple. And we arrived, three of us Western monks, and um, they weren't Buddhas. I mean, they were... Hindu, and you know they looked at us and and they didn't speak any English. And took the lids off our bowl and and uh, kind of looked in and and uh, saw that it was empty and, <laughs> and uh, through a few kind of hand gestures like you know <laughs> then <laughs> they got the idea pretty quickly and and uh, so um, initially they. They said, oh, yes, right, and, and pretty much the whole village came out. Uh, grandmas down to little children were surrounding us. And, and they initially tried to, to give us some uncooked rice. They said, no, 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 sorry, we, we need only cooked food, please. And uh, so this old grandmother um, who had been making these um, cow patties with, the, uh, with uh, the cow manure and making patties of that, she kind of wiped off her hand like this. <laughs> And and they got got the bowl of doll and then reached into the doll with her hands and threw it in her bowl. And uh, but she did it in such a such a sweet way <laughs> that uh, we felt very grateful. And we went back and we we ate it. And and I'm still alive today. <laughs> it's probably had a lot of fiber in it. <laughs> But that was, that was a very moving time because from Sujata village, then you have Naranjara River and just beyond that is Bodhgaya and, and the Bodhi tree. And even from Sujata village, as you start to cross the river, you can see the big monument at Bodhgaya. And so it was just such a moving thing to, to feel that we are walking in the Buddhist footsteps from Sujata village because from that point on, um, Tradition has it, although you don't find it in the Sutta rendition, tradition has it that the, uh, the bowl that he was served this milk rice in, once he was finished, he, 
he set it down in the Narendra River. And he said, if I am to attain full enlightenment on this night, then let the ball float upstream. <laughs> 